so well, we're here tonight to talk about, um, well, essentially to talk about the exhibition that's on at the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace, um, Japan, Courts and Culture. And so we're very lucky to have with us today the lady who curated that exhibition and also produced the uh, glossy book uh, about it, which came out in 2020, because that's when the exhibition was originally supposed to happen. So Rachel Peet um, is the Assistant Curator of Non-European Works of Art at the Royal Collection Trust, um, and is in charge of the Japanese bits of it. Uh, so is the ideal person to uh, tell us what it's all about. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you for your introduction. In May 1929, a high-profile visit took place between the courts of Britain and Japan. King George V's son, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, who you can see just here on the left-hand side, uh, went to the Japanese court to present the Order of the Garter, Britain's highest order of chivalry, to the Emperor Showa. Um, and that uh, reception um, of the son of the British king was seen as a high-profile gesture, not only of good relations between the two families, but of goodwill between the two nations themselves. Speech makers uh, lauded uh, the fact that cheers were resounding to the remotest corners of the empire on the arrival of the prince, and that this uh, showed the traditional friendship of the British royal family, which has helped make the glorious history of modern Japan. And the prince left Japan with a stunning collection of photographs of Kyoto at cherry blossom season, as well as a new taste for collecting netsuke, which he went on to amass uh, throughout his life. But one of the most profound and interesting objects that he returned to Britain with was this uh, model in silver of cockerels on a drum, which was presented to the prince during his stay as an emblem of peace and friendship. Now, it's a very fitting emblem of that theme uh, because this is a kankadori, which is uh, specifically alluding to a legend of a wise ruler who uh, placed a drum outside his gate to be sounded in the event of an attack, um, or for disgruntled citizens to strike um, if they wanted wise counsel or judgment. Um, and so the uh, story goes that uh, there was such an era of peace and good governance uh, that the drum fell into disuse and cockerels took up residence on top of it and leaves started to grow all over it. And so this image of the drum with the cockerel on top became an emblem of eras of harmony, of peace, and of friendly relations. It's a very apt diplomatic gift. But it's made even more personal when you look at what's engraved on the drum itself. On the body, we have chrysanthemums for Japan, roses for Great Britain, and you can't quite just see it, but the dragon for the imperial household. And the reason I begin with this object is because it's just one of many symbols of esteem in the British Royal Collection, which have been sent from the Japanese court as a kind of visual expression of the goodwill and the relations between the two nations. So what I'm going to do this evening is simply talk you through uh, some of those symbols that there are. They range from carp to chrysanthemums, from cranes to coats of arms, um, and I've been asked to pick out some of the symbolism that's alluded to in these gifts. And what we're going to find is that a lot of the uh, symbols draw on a whole range uh, of, of sources of inspiration, from literature to no plays to uh, mythology and religion, the landscape of Japan, but also that when these symbols arrive at the British court, they are misunderstood, they are imitated, they're adapted, and they're cherished um, over time. So to begin with, I want to set the scene by explaining how the very earliest Japanese motifs were in fact relatively misunderstood and mysterious uh, when they were at the British court. During the period of Sakoku, um, from the 1630s right up to the 1850s, uh, Japan was little known uh, at the British court. And to illustrate this, I've just got this uh, map, which is in the Royal Collection, dated from about 1670, purporting to show Japan, which you may not have recognized. Uh, there's an attempt to show the four main islands, uh, but their placement's not accurate and their scale is completely off. 
And this sort of is a reminder, really, um, that if there was very little understanding of the topography of Japan in, in these two centuries, there was even less understanding of the symbols of Japan on works of art that came via trade, particularly via the Dutch. And in, often we find these symbols are hidden in plain sight. So this is an interior from Buckingham House, which is now known as Buckingham Palace. Um, and you'll see we've got two lacquer cabinets um, intermingled very happily with uh, European painting and furniture. And in an inventory from 1829, these cabinets are described as being decorated with landscapes and other devices, which is suitably vague. In fact, uh, among the motifs decorating these cabinets, we've got um, a lion cub among waves, which probably alludes to a Chinese legend of a lioness who tosses her cubs um, into the water to test their strength. And uh, on the inner doors, we've got these uh, wonderful uh, examples of grasses uh, and flowers, which again, probably representing the so-called 10 friends of the literati, alluding to the Japanese love of flowers in poetry. But these go sort of under the radar in the inventories of the time. And certainly, uh, there's no uh, sensitivity to the nuances of these pieces that are being acquired by trade. In fact, it gets worse, because when we find uh, symbols like this on this water basin, which uh, was in the royal collection in the 19th century, we've got uh, pine, uh, we've got the crane symbolizing uh, longevity, said to live for a thousand years, and the Tomoe triple comma uh, motif, which you'd find on temple architecture across Japan, all symbols of long life um, and eternity. On its arrival in Europe, again after it had been traded via Dutch traders, uh, it is, shall we say, encompassed in quite lavish gilt bronze mounts. <laughs> and the intention was, among Europeans at least, that this was a way of expressing actually how cherished these objects were, by um, giving them these very precious uh, gilded mounts to bring them into harmony with the gilded interiors of aristocratic residences. But what has happened here is that instead of the Japanese symbols sort of singing free, uh, really prominent is a Greco-European motif, which is this mask here. This is Bacchus, the god of wine and ec ecstatic pleasure. And I think that probably this bowl had been intended as a water basin, but someone had an idea about filling it with wine. Um, and these two large handles added to the bowl are intended to mimic uh, one of Bacchus's accessories, known as a cantaros, which is this big two-handled goblet. So these Japanese symbols are coming uh, to Britain, but they are being subsumed by the sort of European classical idiom. Um, the biggest culprit uh, here is King George IV. You can see him here. He collected a vast array of Japanese works of art, and he intermingled them extremely liberally uh, with Chinese, Indian, and European imitations at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton and at his London residence, Carlton House. And so what we find is right up until the 1850s, Japanese symbols are um, being uh, sort of very uh, loosely used and misunderstood uh, and intermingled uh, with other works of art. But it's not all bad news uh, because this changes dramatically in the mid 19th century. When Japan reopened to the West, and particularly with European nations, a series of diplomatic agreements are made, including in 1858, a treaty of amity and commerce is signed between Japan and Britain. And this is a landmark moment which paves the way for Japanese objects, works of art, symbols to demonstrate diplomacy. The result of this treaty is that the first British diplomatic representative uh, goes to Japan. So Rutherford Alcock, and you can see him here, being received by the shogun at Edo, uh, the then capital. And to mark this treaty, the shogun decides to send a lavish gift to Queen Victoria. It's the first diplomatic gift between Japan and Britain in something like 250 years. And so the shogun uh, thinks very carefully about what to send. Um, and the gifts become extremely symbolic. Among uh, the works sent, uh, we have lacquer furniture, we have textiles, we have arms and armour, and we have eight pairs of folding screen paintings made by some of the leading court artists. And the scenes chosen for these paintings are very uh, deliberately considered. 
and they include as battle scenes, they include scenes of hunting, of falconry, and of the Japanese landscape. And here you can see uh, Fuji uh, with cranes uh, and pine trees around it, bringing the sort of flora and fauna of Japan right into the heart of the British court. Now what's really interesting to me is that in the selection of the scenes to be sent in this gift in 1860, originally there were 10 pairs that were due to be sent and one pair was removed from the selection. Um, and that was a, a pair of screens depicting uh, uh, scenes from the tale of Genji, Japan's most famous courtly work of literature, composed in the 11th century and celebrated. Uh, but the reason it was removed is because it was considered, quote, unintelligible to foreigners. Mm -hmm. And so clearly the Tokugawa shogun are thinking very carefully about their self-representation in these diplomatic gifts and which symbols will resonate at the British court and which won't. Now further gifts follow in the 1860s when a series of embassies comes to Europe to renegotiate some of the treaties that have been made, including uh, these ambassadors who arrived in 1862. Now this is actually a very fraught diplomatic time because the Japanese are trying to uh, change the terms of the treaties that have been made, which they think are unfair, but at the same time not to irk uh, the Europeans or be seen as being disingenuous and going back uh, on those agreements. And so to kind of smooth the path uh, for these uh, negotiations, diplomatic gifts are sent. And among them are this pair of sake bottles, which we think uh, were sent in 1864. Uh, and a very astute uh, symbol has been uh, picked uh, for this one here on the right. What we have are the so-called three friends of winter, pine, bamboo, and plum blossom. Pine, uh, because it's evergreen, bamboo, which bends in the wind but doesn't break, and plum blossom, which is the first to flower in the new year. And this sort of happy trio is essentially a symbol of steadfastness, of fidelity, of endurance, even in difficult conditions. And so that's the perfect motif to send during this slightly tense moment uh, of diplomatic engagement to uh, indicate a sort of steadfastness and loyalty uh, in these international commitments at the same time as they're trying to renegotiate some of those terms. And things do get a little frosty. Um, in 1863, the British and Japanese forces actually exchanged fire at Kagoshima after the murder of an Englishman and demands for reparations by the British. So the result that a peace offering has to be sent, which is this uh, cup for sake, which you can see here, which is dispatched to Queen Victoria in 1865 as a sign that cause for enmity was removed. Effectively, it's a sort of token of goodwill after this very tense moment, which leaves Japan-British relations teetering on the brink of war for a moment. Um, but particularly helpful at this point is the scene that's depicted on the cup itself. What we have here are a representation of Joe and Uber, two uh, ancient lovers who are reunited on moonlit nights on Takasago Beach. Um, and they are surrounded here by, again, symbols of longevity. So we've got the cranes, we've got the pine, and then we've also got the Minagami tortoise, uh, which is said to be so old uh, that a trail of algae or weed starts to grow uh, along its back. And so everything about this scene is designed to show um, kind of faithful partnership, enduring love and goodwill. Um, and this kind of exuberant meeting, this reunion here, is probably adapted from a no play uh, from the 14th century. Um, and so again, we're seeing some of the sources um, of these symbols are drawn uh, from, from poetry, from theatre, uh, from literature. Um, and it seems a very apt gift uh, for a sorry and thank you makeup present. Further gifts are also sent in 1865 when another embassy comes to Britain uh, to uh, learn about British and European military technology. So very fittingly, they give a set of firearms. Um, and what's interesting about the pair of guns here is that on the butts of the, the rifles, uh, you have these brass plates with a tiger on one side and a dragon on the other, representing respectively west and east. And so there's a very nice sort of duality going on here in the gift, this idea of two partners interacting, visualised uh, in the works that are presented. And these guns went on to be displayed at Sandringham House uh, in Norfolk. 
Now, the use of emblems really continues once uh, visits are made in person by members of the British royal family. The very first uh, member of the British royal family to visit Japan was Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, who was Queen Victoria's second eldest son. And he visited uh, the Emperor Meiji in 1869, which made him the first foreign royal visitor of any nationality to visit uh, the modern Meiji court. He was received by the Emperor uh, in the uh, gardens of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo, and they took tea in the Maple Tea House by the Waterfall Pavilion, exchanged pleasantries, and the Prince presented the Emperor with a diamond-encrusted snuff box uh, from Queen Victoria. And in return, he received a samurai armor, a handwritten uh, tanker by the uh, emperor himself, and a series of lavish lacquer boxes. And I've selected these to show you because they draw on a much wider um, East Asian sort of visual rhetoric, uh, as it were, in the symbolism that's deployed. On the left-hand side here, we have a genre um, that's known as bird and flower pictures. Uh, which um, is drawn from a Chinese ink painting style, uh, which emerged during the Song Dynasty and then was taken up in Japan in the Muromachi period uh, and used particularly on woodblock prints, on painting, but also on lacquer. And the idea is you have these very specific uh, pairings of birds and flowers, which denote specific times of year. So here we've got two pheasants beneath a flowering peach tree, and that's indicative of spring and comes with all the kind of poetic allusions towards spring that would have been known and appreciated at the imperial court. On the right hand side, uh, we've got the dragon, which again across Japan, but also more widely in China, is seen as a celestial being controlling rain. Um, and here the, the um, gem that he's gripping could be either a tide controlling jewel, um, or it could represent the Buddhist Pearl of Enlightenment. And so again, there's that nod to uh, local Buddhist religion uh, adopted um, at the imperial court over time as well in these objects. And certainly the dragon symbol seems to have resonated a little bit uh, with the royal family because while Prince Alfred was in Japan, he in fact got a dragon tattoo on his right arm. <laughs> so he brought back a slightly more permanent symbol of diplomacy when he returned to Britain. Um, I've shown you some of these sort of more regional uh, symbols, but there were some very specifically Japanese uh, iconography uh, deployed as well in these gifts. Um, and I can't go any further without mentioning cherry blossom, which you can see appears here in uh, gold on the scabbard of this dagger. You've got it um, in gold on the lacquer um, of, of the scabbard itself, and then you've got solid gold uh, on the manuki on the sort of fitting uh, of the hilt. Now this uh, dagger was sent to Prince Alfred by the Emperor Meiji just after the uh, visit. Um, and uh, it was very common practice to take a good quality older blade and remount it in stylish contemporary fittings for a diplomatic gift. And so that's what's been done here. The blade dates to about 1500, uh, but the fittings are probably uh, commissioned by Meiji in maybe 1871 after the visit. Except we recently discovered that the Emperor Meiji himself was responsible for choosing the design or even designing the motifs uh, himself. And so he has clearly selected cherry blossom as the sort of defining, unifying concept uh, for this dagger. And that to me again shows you not only how important cherry blossom is as that sort of national flower almost of Japan at this time, but also how involved the imperial family is in deploying these symbols uh, on diplomatic gifts. And it gives a real personal dimension to the presentation of these items. Now, of course, if we're talking cherry blossom, we also need to talk chrysanthemums uh, because chrysanthemums are the imperial household flower, the 16 petaled chrysanthemum having been adopted for uh, exclusive use by the imperial household as their mon after 1869. And so it's no surprise to find on gifts to the British court, uh, we often have the imperial uh, chrysanthemum mon just on the top, particularly, and you can see here on this bronze vase, but it will also appear on the neck of, uh, say, a ceramic uh, vase or similar piece presented. And it almost becomes this trademark stamp that a gift is from the imperial uh, households. But chrysanthemums themselves are not just added as symbols, they become the symbol themselves with the order of the chrysanthemum, Japan's highest order of chivalry. 
It's established in 1876 and it is deliberately modelled on the European form of insignia. So this is the British Order of the Garter, the collar that you would receive uh, in Britain. And after a two year investigation into European forms of insignia and protocol, uh, the Japanese uh, Foreign Ministry launched uh, an honour system by Imperial Decree, which almost identically mirrors that form. And so you can see here, it's the same shape, it's the same style of object, but instead uh, we have the chrysanthemum right front and centre as the symbol uh, of this honour. And in fact, the Order of the Chrysanthemum is presented to numerous members of the British royal family over time, including the first to receive the collar is King Edward VII in 1902. And at the same date, his consort, Queen Alexandra, receives the Order of the Precious Crown, which is Japan's highest order for women. And again, here we've got symbols uh, galore because we've got a uh, cherry blossom, we've got a uh, bird of paradise, and we've got an ancient crown, almost of the style as worn by ancient uh, empresses. So something suggesting the kind of ancient roots of the imperial family, that longevity of the dynasty. And these symbols and exchange go both ways because in 1906, the Emperor Meiji himself is awarded the Order of the Garter. And here you can see Prince Arthur of Connaught, who's Queen Victoria's grandson, buckling the garter on his knee. And it's worth just saying at this point that um, for all your carefully planned symbolism, things can still go awry because when the prince was buckling the garter on the emperor's knee, he managed to prick his finger uh, on the pin and blood went absolutely everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently the emperor Meiji was unfazed and the whole uh, ceremony continued uh, very happily. And I don't unfortunately have time to talk more about other sort of uh, non-tangible symbols like music, national anthems and things like that, but these were all deployed as well uh, in this kind of ceremony. And this is something that uh, John Breen, the historian, has called ornamental diplomacy that's being used between the two courts. As a thank you for uh, receiving the Order of the Garter, the Emperor Meiji actually dispatched uh, Prince Fushimi Sadanaru in 1907, and he brings with him gifts uh, for the royal family. And again, you'll notice they are marked with this uh, imperial chrysanthemum mon. And this is really uh, helpful in, in showing that something is an official gift between the two courts. To the point where we even find the mon up just appearing in slightly unusual locations. So I don't know if you can spot right on the back of this uh, cabinet of drawers, uh, the mon has been placed here as a sort of miniature cabinet. And it was sent to Queen Mary in 1911 as a coronation gift. But we think that it was actually made in about 1907 because the maker, Akatsuka Jitoku, has, um, we think, made this cabinet for the Tokyo exhibition in 1907. And it was there that he received a gold medal for this object. And probably what has happened is that afterwards the imperial family have purchased it and decided to use it as a diplomatic gift, and so at that point applied the chrysanthemum one, almost as a seal of that courtly uh, uh, provenance. But chrysanthemums come really to the fore in 1918, when King George V is made an honorary field marshal in the Japanese army. And this comes uh, during a period of alliance between the two nations, uh, when they fight alongside one another in the First World War. Um, and this is remarkable because King George V is the only foreign recipient of this honour, this honorary rank, and it comes with it, uh, with, you get with it a field marshal's sword, which is presented to him at Buckingham Palace in October 1918. And he actually writes in his handwritten diary, um, a very nice little ceremony, well carried out. So he clearly uh, appreciated the gesture. But you'll see again, we've got gold chrysanthemums uh, studying the scabbard and the blade itself of the sword is inlaid with a gold chrysanthemum. It's also inscribed by the maker, Gasan Sadakazu, uh, saying, uh, made on a lucky day in 19, 1918, at the age of 83. So if you're thinking of retiring, you've still got a few swords left in you yet I think, to make. Um, but the blade itself is actually in the form of the earliest known Japanese blade to have a deliberately forged curve. Um, and that, that blade is known as Little Crow, um, and it's in the uh, Japanese imperial household collection. So what you've got here are these kind of layers of symbolism, not just in the shape uh, of the sword, not just in the chrysanthemums, but what it represents, this honorary rank. 
And again, the chrysanthemum here, in every instance, is appealing to this idea of longevity uh, because uh, the, the flower blooms for an extended period uh, every autumn uh, and is associated with long life. And that's something we see far more broadly in the gifts uh, that are sent to the British Royal Court, that the landscape is being used to express uh, wishes uh, for long life. So when King Edward VII uh, becomes king and is crowned in 1902, the Emperor Meiji sends him a really lavish embroidered folding screen, which I think, uh, again, is, is suggesting or conveying this wish for long life. Because what you've got in the four panels are representations of the four seasons. So the different uh, birds and flowers uh, indicate different times of year. You've got the crane for winter, chrysanthemums for autumn, cherry blossom for spring. Um, and between them, they suggest this idea of changing time, but also a cyclical nature uh, to life itself. And ideas of renewal, regeneration, which of course is perfect for a coronation gift, a time of change of reign. One of the birds that also uh, features uh, on the screen is the peacock, and that's got particular courtly uh, associations in Japan. Um, not least because the very first peacock we know about to arrive in Japan was a gift to the emperor in 598 AD uh, from the king of Korea. Um, and so over the years, uh, peacocks were presented as gifts and associated with the imperial palace, the imperial gardens. Um, and so they've got that idea of royalty as well as connotations of immortality. And so that makes uh, the peacock a very good gift in 1935 when King George V, he's the one who's the field marshal, remember, celebrates his silver jubilee. And so he receives this embroidered panel uh, with a peacock, which again, I think, is alluding to further wishes uh, for a long reign. Five years later, King George V receives another bird expressing a wish for long life because uh, this writing box, you can just about make out, I hope, is decorated with plovers um, flying in gold across that sort of speckled nashiji uh, background. And the plover in Japan is associated with long life because its cry, the sound that it makes, uh, sounds like chiyo, which means a thousand generations. Mm -hmm. And so poets had kind of explored this, this kind of connotation, this association between um, the bird uh, and a kind of wish for eternity, a wish for longevity, um, as early as the 10th century. And actually this appears in the kind of imperial waka um, anthologies that are enjoyed at court. So everything about this gift is symbolic of poetry, it's a writing set, uh, but also uh, this idea uh, of long life and a, a kind of being attuned to nature uh, in that mode. But I want to finish really by just showing you some of the shared symbols which kind of draw back on that first cockerel on the drum that we saw uh, when we began. And these shared symbols really come to the fore in the early 20th century, when, as I mentioned, Japan and Britain had this alliance. They talk of one another as two island empires of East and West. And to cement this relationship, there's a whole series of reciprocal visits between the two courts, including in 1922, um, Edward, Prince of Wales, who went on to become King Edward VIII, the one who abdicated, uh, he goes to Japan um, as heir to the British throne. Um, and during that visit, a whole range of symbols are deployed to represent this relationship, including the Prince Regent Hirohito getting for him and giving him his own personal kimono, uh, including a mon selected for himself. Um, I only discovered this last week that he is given his own sort of mon as a symbol. Um, I've, I've seen it described as the circle and double peers, uh, but I don't know what that means, and I need to do a little bit more uh, research on that. Uh, but it sounds like it was taken from a local daimyo and adopted uh, by the prince himself. And so we get this moment where uh, members of the British royal family are literally wearing or embodying uh, these Japanese symbols during their visits. While uh, the prince is in Japan, he's also presented with a number of completely unique objects. Uh, this uh, box for letters um, is a very traditional form, um, a style used in Japan from the 16th century to transport letters and documents. And usually the decoration is designed to be suitably impressive to reflect the importance of the objects inside. 
But here we have, and I hope you can see it on the screen, uh, Prince of Wales's feathers decorating the lacquer. And this is the only known example I've ever found uh, of this motif uh, uh, on a fubaco, so I think it's unique. Um, and it reflects this sort of marriage, again, of the two nations. And even inside, the scroll that's contained within uh, is decorated, the brocade on the back has got uh, Prince of Wales's feathers and white chrysanthemums uh, around it. And the, the wording of the address celebrates the fact that the prince is in Japan exactly one year after Crown Prince Hirohito had been dining at Buckingham Palace during his visit to Britain. So there's a lovely sort of parody going on there. And a very similar thing is happening uh, with this casket and stand, which is in the form of a traditional uh, Buddhist sutra uh, box, the kind that you find in the Shosoin um, in the Imperial Repository in Nara. But again, I think unique, because on the top in enamel, we have the British Royal Coat of Arms. And this has been applied in uh, Moriage, so um, piled up uh, layers of enamel. Um, so I'm afraid you can't see on the image, it actually stands out in relief, so it's quite dramatic. Um, and again, this has been produced by the Ando Company, who were um, uh, suppliers to the imperial household, particularly for enamel wares. And so they've evidently been commissioned to produce something distinctive to reflect the importance of this visit. And again, this kind of synergy between the two cultures. But the very final thing that I want to show you is actually a gift uh, from the reign of Her Late Majesty the Queen uh, and presented in 1971 when she hosted a state visit by the Emperor Hirohito. And you can see them here arriving at Buckingham Palace. And during that visit, the gift from the Emperor was this embroidered folding screen, which in <coughs> fact uh, shows a scene from the tale of Genji. Uh, because uh, the uh, courtiers are playing kickball or kamari uh, beneath the cherry blossom. And this is a moment in sort of chapter 34 of the novel uh, where Prince Genji's wife is, is behind a screen and she's watching uh, them play kickball. And as she watches, uh, she falls in love. Um, and what I think is really fascinating here is that if you recall, a hundred years previously, in 1860, a screen with a scene from the tale of Genji was removed from a diplomatic gift because it was felt to be unintelligible to uh, members of the British royal family. And so there's been this lovely cadence to relations as uh, a growing awareness, a growing understanding, and a growing confidence, I think, in the Japanese court at the expression of goodwill through these symbols um, has taken place. <laughs> And in fact, in 1971, during that state visit, uh, Queen Elizabeth II made a speech at the state banquet where she said, people can be fascinated by things which are remote and mysterious, but they can only like and admire things which they know and understand. That's why I believe every contact between our two peoples is to be fostered and encouraged. Well, I hope that you can see that journey that has taken place between that complete sort of blindsiding uh, of uh, Japanese symbols uh, in the British uh, royal court right up to this new admiration um, and enjoyment, um, very much transforming these symbols simply from pictures or icons to symbols of esteem. So thank you very much for listening, and I do look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you.